In part one, we examined the evolution of the law of war and the consequences of having weak or unenforceable rules regarding military conflict. In part two, we explored the delineation of conflict between nation states and conflict between groups inside a nation state. As we saw, any lines of distinction are often blurry. That fact can lead to conflict which is ostensibly internal or domestic, taking on an international dimension. That risk is particularly high when a domestic conflict, as outlined in Part 2, involves a scorched earth approach as described in Part 1. A more modern variant of the scorched earth approach is the intentional and calculated attempt to wipe out a particular group. Motivated by fear and or contempt, sometimes leaders of one group presume that their own security can only be guaranteed if they completely eliminate another group. If not driven by a survival instinct or fear, such behavior can also be driven by ideology. During World War II, Nazi Germany pursued a military scorched earth policy known as Blitzkrieg and implemented the final solution to the Jewish question. War took center stage when Germany invaded Poland in September of 1939. The creation of discriminatory and even deadly policies and rules continued. A 1941 regulation foresaw the loss of citizenship if one resided outside of Germany. When combined with deportations, this loss of citizenship triggered a loss of all property, including any contractual rights, such as insurance. All such property reverted to the state. As bold and of questionable legality as such laws and rules were, even worse policies were being developed behind the scenes. The greatest example of this was the so-called Final Solution, discussed and approved by party leadership at a conference outside of Berlin. After the war and the Holocaust, this approach to targeting particular groups got its own legal name, the crime of genocide. The Nazi attempt to extinguish all Jews from Europe was not the first nor the last example of one group following through on this kind of policy. It led to the creation of a specific body of law aimed at preventing the reoccurrence of such atrocities ever again. The international law of genocide evolved from the Nuremberg Trials to the Genocide Convention, which now has more than 150 signatory nations. Any government of a contracting party has an affirmative obligation under international law to prevent and to punish genocide. Article 2 of that convention defines genocide as follows. The Convention obligates contracting parties to enact relevant legislation and to enforce those laws in the event any acts of genocide are committed.
with new legal norms aimed at avoiding repetition of the Holocaust, backed up institutionally with the newly created United Nations, the world entered a new era, or so everyone thought. The Cold War pitted the two camps of democracy and communism against each other. This period saw a series of proxy wars on several continents. It also saw another form of attempted genocide, this time driven more by ideology as opposed to ethnicity or religion. The communist Khmer Rouge attempted to create Year Zero and a new society which had rid itself of all perceived ideological threats. From their strongholds in the jungles and countryside, the Khmer Rouge troops were successful in defeating the Loyalist troops and in 1975 captured the capital of Phnom Penh. There then followed a period of political infighting amongst various factions. A group of communist hardliners led by Pol Pot won the upper hand. The leaders followed a policy of emptying the cities in an attempt to build an agrarian utopia in the countryside. Some historians believe this was an attempt to return the country to the glory days of the ancient Khmer Empire. A massive resettlement of people then followed, and money was abolished in an attempt to establish a purely agrarian economy. Labor camps sprung up throughout the country, and when there was no real work to do, people were forced to move dirt from one area to another, and then back. The Khmer Rouge then turned their attention to perceived enemies, which were basically anyone who posed a threat to their tight grip on power. Ethnic minorities, foreigners, urban dwellers, anyone with an education, all these people were primary targets for the Khmer Rouge killing machine. In what came to be known as the killing fields, hundreds of thousands of Cambodians lost their lives. In addition to these blatant rural massacres, it is estimated that the Khmer Rouge established over 150 security prisons across the country. One of the most notorious, Twol Slang, was a high school up until the Civil War. It is now a museum dedicated to the victims of the Cambodian genocide. The Khmer Rouge killing would have continued had it not been for the intervention of the Vietnamese army. It actually took another newly communist country, Vietnam, to end the mass killings in Cambodia. This horrible episode led to a revisit of the law of genocide and eventually to the establishment of a dedicated UN tribunal to prosecute the perpetrators. But this was not the end of attempts at genocide in the 20th century. Other continents had their own examples involving organized massacres along ethnic lines. The breakup of Yugoslavia unleashed long pent-up ethnic tensions and what became known as ethnic cleansing.
Just three years later, the United Nations and the international community had to deal with another attempted genocide, this time in Africa. The UN troops were helpless to prevent a mass slaughter which cost hundreds of thousands their lives. We cover both the events and the attempts at seeking justice for victims at both the international and local levels in the Living Law Nations episode for Rwanda. With each cycle of violence and reprisal, the division upon ethnic lines became embedded in Rwandan society. Both the Organization of African Unity and the United Nations attempted to restore peace in the region. In August 1993, a peace treaty was signed between President Habyarimana and the leaders of the Rwandan Patriotic Front. The former enemies embraced and pledged to implement the provisions of the agreement. In the words of one commentator, a new political chapter had been opened in Rwanda, and it remained to be seen how leaders of the two opposing camps would stick to their Arusha pledge to bring peace to a country that had for three decades been torn apart by tribal conflicts. But peace remained elusive, and when the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi died in a suspicious plane crash, this sparked a match to the tinderbox that was Rwanda. Extremists gained the upper hand in Hutu political parties and communities and set about to protect the country against the Tutsi invaders. United Nations troops were limited by their mandate and overwhelmed by the situation. Rwandan radio attributed the president's plane crash to members of the Rwandan Patriotic Front with assistance from United Nations soldiers. Soon there was little that foreign troops or anyone could do to prevent a massacre that had been weeks, if not months, in the planning. At night, Hutu militia groups rounded up Tutsi citizens and brought them to makeshift detention centers. Emboldened by the ease of these actions, such groups began going door-to-door -door in neighborhoods, even in broad daylight. Roadblocks were used in an effort to prevent anyone from escaping. Identity cards, with their designation of a person's ethnicity, became a convenient tool for the militias in carrying out their plan. The genocides in Rwanda and Cambodia brought with them some harsh lessons for the international community. The focus on punishment in the 1948 convention had not produced the desired deterrence effect. Even the most carefully crafted legal provisions could not prevent genocide if they were ignored by the society in question and there was no backup authority to enforce them. The recent history of Rwanda was a reminder of what can happen if humans' darker side prevails. The issue of genocide seems to still be with us in the 21st century. An earlier example of mass killing which occurred prior to the creation of the law of genocide took place during the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. Historical records and accounts show that hundreds of thousands of Armenians from across the Ottoman Empire were marched into the desert to their death. Many Armenians consider that these acts also constituted genocide and the period proved to be a defining one for the Armenian people. They and other nations have periodically sought acknowledgement of the events by the successor government of the Ottoman Empire, the Republic of Turkey. Turkey, for its part, has rejected such calls which conflict with special criminal laws aimed at any acts deemed to insult Turkishness. 
We cover these issues in both countries' Living Law Nations episodes. Fast forwarding to the present, some see the actions in northwest Myanmar undertaken by the government against the Rohingya minority as a form of attempted genocide. Some also put the recent treatment of the Uyghur minority by the government of the People's Republic of China in this category. Both actions have led to international condemnation, as well as sanctions, a topic we shall get to later. So if there is a clear body of law dealing with genocide, and an international institutional responsibility to prevent or at least intervene, why do we still periodically see these attempts? Is there something missing at the international level to make the agreed-upon laws effective in practice? The same question applies to armed conflict which does not rise to the level of genocide. That is a perfect segue to our next topic, the interaction between individual nations and the rest of humanity, and the various tools available to diplomats and others involved in international peacemaking. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. 